So it is 2.11, we'll talk for about an hour and then we'll take a break, okay? So, uh, so you know, my PowerPoint decks um, sometimes get mixed up when I convert them over to Blackboard because Blackboard turns them into a PDF to post them uh, on, on Collaborate, but the, the, the PowerPoint decks hopefully will be in better shape when, when, you, when you download them or pull them up from the Blackboard site, okay? So when we think, when we think about biology, we think about everything that's the study of life. And really, when we think about that, uh, this is cellular and molecular, right? And so when we think about cellular and molecular, it is about how the cell interacts and how all the different components of the cells interact so that we can live out our lives, right? So that all the cells have to be working together, uh, whether they're tissues or organs or individual cells doing their own thing and they have to communicate with each other, right? So the cells in our body are very complicated, right? Uh, there's a lot going on. And so that's what the focus of this particular course is. But there's a whole other part of the, of the gross picture of the, um, of the planet that we call ecology, right? And that's the study of the environment that we live in. And so the study of ecology and how organisms are uh, looked at phylogenetically and how they're looked at from a morphological perspective is really the focus of biology 1407, which is the course that comes after this if you are following a science tract, right? And so can anybody tell me um, what this particular image is supposed to represent? Right here, what does this image represent? Can anybody tell me? Yes, Annabelle. Uh, mass extinction event. Oh, mass extinction event. Look at you. I like it. Yeah. So the last one that happened uh, <laughs> happened about 65 million years ago in a place called Chichalub. And so that was the really, that was the end of the reign of the dinosaurs on the planet and the beginning of the reign of the mammals, right? And that's when mammals took over. And you and I are mammals, right? So there are no more dinosaurs, although there's lots of uh, descendants of them, chickens and birds, right? And other reptiles are all descendants of dinosaurs. But, uh, but this represents that. And so if we look at the entire of the entire path of what life is on the planet, right? Right now, we're looking at potential, is there potential evidence for life on other planets or other galaxies? And that's hugely interesting to me, right? Um, but we need to be focused in on what's going on on our planet um, because we're destroying the planet, right? We're the, the most invasive species that there is on this planet and we're destroying it, right? And so. This is the kind of things I want you to think about. And everything that we're doing to this planet affects us, what we call the term epigenetics. How many people have ever heard of the term epigenetics? How many people have ever heard of that? Epigenetics. Kelly, tell me, what have you heard? Well, I'm not sure how true this is, but... Um just behaviors being passed on from generation to generation. Um, okay, that's that's just genetics. But epigenetics well, means okay, go ahead, go ahead, Kelly. Uh it was like like you draw certain circumstances into your life, mm. even if you okay, didn't. Okay, I like know. That. I like that better. I like okay. that better. Epigenetics are all the different factors that are in your life that are epi means on top. So epigenetics are things that are in the environment that are causing something to happen in your cells. Because remember, all disease happens at a cellular and a molecular level, right? And all these things that are out there, smoking, eating too many potato chips, right? Um, all these different things that are out there that, and that's not even just considering just walking outside and coming in contact with pollutants that are out there, right? But all those different things are having an effect on our cells. They're having an effect on our cells. And sometimes if they have an effect on our cells, they're having an effect 
on the genetic code and they're causing mutations, which is then causing us to, uh, to have problems, right? And so it's so interesting to me that the science has come so far, cellular and molecular science has come so far that we now know individuals, individual genes, right? The BRCA gene, right? That can cause ovarian or uh, breast cancer in females uh, if they have a mutation in that gene, right? And so we can personalize the way that we attack those cancers and attack the mutation and not really, I think in very short, in a very short time, even maybe even in my lifetime, I might have 20 good years left. Even in my, my expected lifetime, I think that we're going to personalize medicine so effectively that we're going to be able to cure cancer in each individual by just simply fixing their genetic code, right? And I think that's pretty cool. Now, there's a lot of problems with that, right? Because a lot of people don't want to deal with this kind of stuff. They don't want to, they don't want us to play God, right? But, you know, our science has moved so far now that we have these good understandings of cellular and molecular processes of cancer. We know a lot about it, right? That's what makes science so interesting. It's forever changing. And there's tons of information that's coming in on a daily basis, right? And so people who are listen to something on the news and hear something, and then a month later they hear something different, and they're like, all oh, those scientists don't know what they're talking about. They change their mind again, right, with COVID. Think about all the different changes. Now, the CDC, to me, is a problem right now. But if you think about, you know, some of the, some of the ideas that we had early on about how COVID works, those have changed because now we have a really good understanding about the mechanism and how the ACE2 receptors in our body allow this particular virus to attach and the virus then tricks the body to allow it, that virus to get into the cells and then it causes all kinds of problems, right? And so that's the beauty of science. Science is dogmatic. Right? We believe what we believe today, but a month from now, that might be different, right? The, the study of how DNA replicates has not changed in 50 years. Well, that's because all of the science that has occurred after Watson and Crick and um, all those other researchers before what we, you know, back in the 50s, all the work they did, all of the studies that we're doing now support, continue to support that. So we have this mountain of evidence that basically says that's the way it is. And so that science hasn't changed in a long time, right? But there's a lot of new stuff going on with epigenetics and a bunch of other things that we're constantly changing the way we look at things because of the information that's coming in. I can't keep up with it, right? I was getting seven scientific journals. I could not keep up with it. So I went down to one. <laughs> I'm going to do one good, right? Make, uh, I'm going to do one well, because I just couldn't keep up with it, right? And maybe this year, I'll look at uh, mechanisms in bacterial infections. But maybe next year, I might do something with um, antimicrobial agents. And uh, next year, I might just simply uh, take on the journal of uh, mutated cells, right? Uh, but you have to really get your information and be able to understand that. And I just simply don't have time to look at all of the information that's coming in, right? So biology is a systematic study of all those things that make up life, right? How a single cell develops into an organism, right? Isn't that interesting? You have the fusion of a sperm and an ovum. It develops into a diploid cell and then from there oh my god uh, a whole organism develops isn't that interesting so check this out we have the technology right now that we can clone people there have been some other countries that have cloned individuals right it's frowned upon and basically it has been said you shall not do that by the scientific community of the world but there's some countries that are pushing that 
right? And so it's interesting to think about how those things can happen. And then if you put mutations in those individuals to make them stronger or smarter, now you have a whole different group of organisms, right? And that's that can be pretty scary to people. Right? That's really interesting if you think about that, right? Uh, but we now have the technology. How many people have heard of CRISPR? How many people have heard of CRISPR? Yes, Elijah. At my high school, they taught about it in my freshman year. Look at that. What high school did you go to? Lake Travis. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So gene editing, that's correct. And so I don't know if you know this. Maybe Elijah does because it seems that Lake Travis kept him on the track. But there have been two individuals that had sickle cell disease where they've used CRISPR technology to go in and edit their genes so they no longer have so they no longer have sickle cell. Isn't that cool? So what that means application wise is that somebody who has cancer will be able to go into those cancer cells and either, this was the initial thought, just simply say, hey, cancer cells, we need you to become apoptic. What does that mean when some cell undergoes apoptosis? What does that mean? What does that mean? when a cell undergoes apoptosis, it's, that is correct. It is programmed cellular death, right? So you can already see that you guys are exactly what I thought you were. You have a lot more knowledge than the people I teach in 1308 who are just now trying to understand what a cell is, right? You guys know all this stuff. But this is just a beautiful thing that we can think about these things, right? So our initial thought was we can edit these genes and tell these cancer cells to die. But now we have the ability to go in there and basically say, hey, you know what, uh, you cells, you used to be a liver cell. We want you to go back to be a liver cell. Now, I don't know about that, right? So to me, my initial thought, because my, do my dad died of gastric cancer, he died a horrible death, and my and my uncle died of prostate cancer that metastasized and went to his lungs. So to me, I ha I'm still under the old train of thought that if you have cancer and you can resect it, you should resect it. What do I mean by that, resect it? What does that mean? What does resection mean? Who can tell me what resection means? Anybody? Anybody ever heard of that? Does it just mean you kill it? Not, not that you kill it, but that you cut it out. That's right. So I am under the school of thought that if you have the ability to cut that cancer out and it is only at stage one or maybe even stage zero, then you're not gonna have a problem with it. Get rid of it, right? But now, and I, maybe I'll change my mind, right? The cool thing about science is somebody brings something up and a whole bunch of people agree, but another whole bunch of people say, uh-uh, resection is still best, right? So maybe I'll change my mind, but I'm going to have to see a whole lot more data before I change my mind, right? And that's the cool thing about science. You can have different opinions because what makes science cool is that people are always challenging each other to make sure that we are communicating the best information, okay? Questions? All right. So if we think about this, the classification of life, and I'm gonna show you the, the most current phylogenetic tree, probably we won't get there today, but we'll, we'll talk about it on Monday. But the phylogenetic tree really has changed a lot. And um, so there are really three big groups of organisms on the planet. And it, I think it's gonna be interesting for you to figure out what those are. And we're gonna talk about this on Monday. But for right now, I want you to think about how different organisms sequester and really create energy, right? Some of them are phototrophic, right? Some of them are heterotrophic. Some of them can be lithotrophic. 
there's lots of different ways that these organisms can develop the energy they need to continue to survive. And we're going to be looking at some of those mechanisms, right? So life is defined in real simple terms. Now think about this, right? From a legal perspective, you have to have a heart beating and you have your brain has to be functioning. Legal definition, right? But that's not the, that is not the biological definition. The biological definition is that your cells have to be, can, have to be working, right? Because if your cells are working, then there's always a chance that some mechanism can be altered at the molecular level so that we can bring you back to life. Isn't that interesting, right? So life is recognized by what we do, right? And the characteristics of everything that is living or the, the thing, everything that's living has certain characteristics. And so if we think about those, then they're easy to uh, figure out. The biodiversity of the oceans, right? If we think about how those things are, yeah, they're really important as an ecosystem, but you know, to me, that particular, those organisms there probably hold the key to how we could solve a lot of the problems of the world. We just haven't done enough research on what the substances and the, mo the molecules that those organisms produce that might be beneficial to us, right? And so you, you hear this word molecule come out of my mouth because that's what science really is about nowadays. It's about the molecules that are out there that are biologically active because there are a lot of molecules out there that can do really great things for us, right? The problem is the molecules can also have a negative, a negative effect on life, right? So here you can see, I have an image of the planet going up in smoke. Can you name a couple of molecules that might be detrimental to our planet? CO2. CO2 is a good one. Mm -hmm. Methane. Anything else? Methane's another one, right? Yeah, those Carbon are all greenhouse gases. What's that? Nitrogen. Depending on what, Brandon, depending on how you look at nitrogen, right? Because if you say amino acid, it's got nitrogen, eh, maybe not. But if you say nitrite or nitrate, that might be a different story, right? Because those are things, or urea, right? Or things like that, though, that might be a different story, right? But what's happening with those greenhouse gases, let's take CO2, is that we used to have all of this lush greenery on the planet, and that lush greenery would take in the CO2 and convert that CO2. This is a, mis this is a misconception by a lot of people, right? Plants do not convert sunlight into ATP. Plants convert CO2 using sunlight into sugars. And then the sugars are used metabolically to make ATP, right? But what's going on with CO2 is there's so much of it that it is going into the oceans because the oceans are what absorbing most of the CO2. The oceans have always absorbed CO2 because that's where different things come out like calcates and things like that. And that's how barnacle and coral are formed. But now there's so much in the ocean that it's becoming carbonic acid and it's killing a lot of the reefs, right? This has happened at the molecular level, right? So hopefully you're seeing the importance of understanding at the molecular level, how things work, right? It's really important because it's either going to cause us to flourish as a planet or it's going to cause us to die, right? And when I mean death, I don't know that lots of people will say, you know, we're in the middle. If you think about it, we've had five major extinctions on the planet, right? Some people believe that we are in the middle of the sixth major extinction on the planet. And it's happening. We're losing lots of organisms. Uh, I've, I've seen an estimate, although I'm, I find it hard to believe, but I'm seeing an estimate that we're losing about six organisms off the planet on a daily basis. I would probably say maybe one, but six seems a lot. Either way, let's just take one, right? 
if we do not change, um, it's gonna it's gonna become a part where that a extinction is gonna become, um, or it's gonna be exacerbated so that it's gonna be to the point where we're not gonna be able to stop it. We might already be there, right? I don't know if you've all have noticed, but some of the trees that were supposed to lose their leaves already have not lost their leaves, right? I have a Monterey oak in my front yard, a chinka pink oak that has not lost its leaves. It still has them. And that's because it's been too warm this year. They're finally turning brown because we've had, I don't know, four or five days of freezing, right? But, you know, the, to me, I have never seen that tree uh, not lose its leaves. And I had a pecan tree that's in the middle of my yard that did the same thing, although it's now lost all its leaves, but it didn't lose its leaves until the beginning of January. And usually they lose their leaves in November. There's something going on that is happening to this planet and it's happening at the molecular level, at the cellular level, right? But people don't wanna talk about it. So tell me what you see here. Somebody tell me what you see here. Yes, Annabella. It a uh, like a wetland. A wetland. Okay, good. Uh, uh, how many organisms are there? Probably like um, like fifty at minimum. Okay, L let's go this way. Do you think you might? Do you think you and I, if we were doing research on this wetland? Do you think we could count the organisms that are in this environment in our lifetime? Probably not. No. There's too many there. And there's things we don't even know about that are there. And that's the cool thing about a little lot we don't know, right? Uh, it's an amazing thing to think about. Right, because most of the organisms that we can see that are nice and big and green and lush, right, we'll be able to speciate those very easily. But the protozoan and the invertebrates and the bacteria that are that are in this particular ecosystem, we might not know everything that's there. Right. Let me give you an example. In your mouth, there are about 550 known species of bacteria. But how many bacteria do you really think are in your mouth? Kelly, what have you, what do you have to say about that? Or anybody? There are probably uh, thousands. Of, Could be yeah. millions. I'd say we don't so. know. Billions or trillions. Well, there's a lot, right, for sure. So think about that the next time you put a smoochie on your on your loved one, right? That you're really <laughs> you're really sharing a bunch of different organisms when you kiss somebody on the mouth. Right? And that's pretty cool. Or maybe not cool. It might be kind of interesting to think about, right? Yeah. So the there's been a lot of studies about the organisms in the intestinal tract because that's another thing that we know a lot about, right? But we don't know very much because there's a lot of things in your intestinal tract that we don't understand yet. As a matter of fact, there are scientists out there, me including, that believe that if we had a balanced flora, a balanced microbiome of the intestinal tract, we would have less diabetes, we would have less depression, we would have less of a lot of the diseases that affect us as humans. So there are, there are individuals studying the organisms that were in the intestinal tract in the 1800s. And they're looking to see if they can mimic what was there in the 1800s in the human's digestive tract and maybe put those organisms into the digestive tract of us as uh, 2000 and 2022 humans and see what would happen, right? That's that's an interesting hypothesis to try to figure out, 
right? If we alter the intestinal tract of humans to mimic those things where we had less problems with diabetes, we had less problems with depression, could it make us a healthier population? I think that's a great hypothesis, right? But we're not gonna know right away, right? Because first we have to figure out what was in the intestinal tract in the 1800s, right? By the way, has anybody ever heard of a fecal transplant? Anybody ever heard of a fecal transplant? I have, and I think this might be from your micro class. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the, the fecal transplant is when individuals are having problems with their intestinal tract for whatever reason, right? And a lot of things have to do with epigenetics, how we've affected the intestinal tract, that we can see the intestinal tract again with organisms that we understand to be helpful right now, and that will make the patient healthier. And Dell, the Dell Hospital, Dell Children's Hospital, is one of the leading researchers in pediatric uh, fecal transplant. I think that's really cool. Uh, it's just amazing to think about how there's some really cool things going on right here, and you haven't heard of them all. So if we look at the disciplines in science, right here they are. I mean, there's just so many. A, a degree in science will allow you to do all kinds of different things. It opened doors for me left and right, right? And what I will tell you is when opportunities occur that you should go through those doors, right? I always wanted to be an epidemiologist. I got trained as an epidemiologist. I have the background as an epidemiologist. And um, my wife kind of said, hmm, I don't want you getting exposed to all these really dangerous infectious agents because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go and chase Ebola, right? Uh, and so I, I then tried to become an epidemiologist at the state, at the state level. And I had a hard time getting in there because mostly they wanted me to start at the entry level, which I already had too much background. And so a door opened up um, for me to go and work at Johnson & Johnson. And I went through that door and it was probably the best job, the best career I ever had. I was at J&J &J for 10 years and I absolutely loved it. I would probably still be there had they not closed my plant. My plant was where Ikea is over in Round Rock. You guys know where that is up by the, by the, the, the different stores out there, right? That's hallowed ground to me. I don't go to Ikea because that used to be my plant, right? But uh, it was the best job I have I ever had. And microbiology, cellular and molecular biology opened those doors so that I could go and work at J&J. &J. And that was pretty cool. So there'll be lots of doors that open up for you all. Never be afraid to go and walk through those doors because usually there's something really good on the other side. Okay. So Sir Francis Bacon is given credit for really putting parameters and defining the scientific method, right? And so if we think about that for a minute, the scientific method is about observation, right? That's the first thing you have to understand. Usually we make an observation, we put a hypothesis, a hypothesis together, right? A thought, an idea of what might be going on. And then we use the scientific method to prove it or disprove it. And then we make changes and then we're going in with the hypothesis until we figure out what's going on, right? So here, I want you guys to engage with me. This is my garden in the backyard. You'll see pictures of my garden because my wife and I are pretty proud of it. We grow cucumbers, squash, peppers, limes, lemons, peaches. We grow cantaloupe. Uh, we grow pomelos, we grow avocados, we grow lots of different things in our backyard. Here's a pepper plant. And so uh, the pepper plant started losing its leaves and we're like, what the heck is going on, right? And so if you look at this pepper plant, could you provide a hypothesis, a reason for why you believe the pepper plants are losing their leaves. Could you do that for me? 
What do you think? Come up with some ideas. Uh, so bugs are eating it. Okay, good. I like that. Caterpillars are eating it. Okay, good. Anything else? Lack of nutrients. I like that, Connor. I like that. Not enough water. Love it, Frida. Love it. What else? Anybody else? Needs more water or sunlight. Okay, I like that. I like that, Kelly. Others that I've had before or uh, weeds are nearby. <laughs> okay. Co competition. Okay, very good. Extreme temperature. I like that. These are all beautiful ideas. Some of the other ideas that we had one time was that a coon was coming by and and eating the leaves. Well, the coon would probably eat the peppers, but not the leaves, right? But it was a good idea, right? Can anybody, can anybody tell me, can you see the culprit of what's causing my peppers to lose their leaves? It's in the actual, it's in the actual image. Can you see it? Anybody see it? That's right here. that big old caterpillar. Are you with me? But it does so well to camouflage itself that if you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. Because my wife, we're sitting there talking to each other. What can be doing this? I don't understand. And then it moved and we're like, oh, there it is, right? And uh, it's a swallowtail caterpillar. It's a huge thing. And we didn't see it. And we're both scientists, right? I'm a microbiologist. She's a forensic scientist, right? That, that's her thing. Uh, but we're like, oh my God. So it took us some time to just look at these peppers, right? But what the interesting thing is, the peppers weren't being eaten. The leaves were being eaten, which then affects the ability of the plant to sequester energy from the sun and carbon dioxide from the environment and make sugar right? So the plant was going to die. Well, it didn't need to die because it was getting eaten by these things, right? So I took that big old caterpillar and I put it on the table and a bird came by and took it. And, you know, I said, well, uh, that bird got a really good meal, right? Because in nature, everything is food for something else. And that's really wonderful to think about, right? We were all scientific about it. My wife and I just sitting there talking about, you know, we thought about the same thing. Maybe we're not giving it enough iron. You know, maybe there's not enough nitrogen in the soil. What's going on? So, and, and it was because we were too busy thinking about what was going on scientifically that we missed the observation. And so I'm telling you this here because my wife and I are both trained as researchers, but we missed an important factor. We jumped to immediately thinking about hypothesis, but we didn't look at what was in front of us. We didn't observe what was going on. We observed that it was losing its leaves, but we didn't observe what, what else was on that plant that might be causing that, right? And that is the interesting thing about science, right? There's so many ways to approach it, but you have to understand what you're looking at first, right? You have to seek first to understand. Now that's not my saying, right? Um, there was a famous um, person, I can't remember his name right now, but, uh, oh, Stephen Covey, who basically said, one of the first things that have to happen when you're solving problems is you have to seek first to understand. And that's what we have to do with scientists. We have to understand what's going on first. Then we make a hypothesis, right? Y'all did splendid when you're thinking about these things. So the scientific method really basically says, you know, you make an observation, you ask some questions, you form a hypothesis, you predict what might happen when you try to test that hypothesis, you put that under an experiment, right? And then you analyze the results. If, it's, if the hypothesis is incorrect, you make changes and you try again. If it's correct, you redo the experiment to make sure that you have enough information to say that hypothesis is probably true. Now, in the general public, people use the word theory collect colloquially, right? They say, I have a theory about who the bachelor's gonna peak, uh, who the bachelor's gonna pick tonight, right? Well, that's, that's a hypothesis, it's a guess, right? 
The difference between that and science is that science, when we talk about theory, that's a scientific theory, scientific theory eventually becomes a law. Because what happens is we have hypothesis, we've tested that hypothesis over and over again, that it becomes a theory, and that theory is backed by evidence, by mountains of evidence, right? So that's what I'm saying, you know? In 1954, when Watson and Creek basically said, this is the way DNA replicates, and this is the way it's structured, lots of people did all kinds of research to prove that. And when they said, yeah, this is the way it is, nobody's been able to disprove that, right? So right now that's our current thought, right? But this is the way science works. And so you might have 50% of the scientists basically say, we don't believe it. But uh, after enough, after about enough scientific research, eventually what happens is a lot of those scientists start to come together and basically say, this is the way it is. And it becomes theory. Be sure you know the difference between scientific theory and everyday theory. Because, you know, I no longer try to correct people about using the word theory. We just have to understand that that word is used differently in the everyday vernacular of people. Because if you go around and tell them, well, it's not really a theory, you're, you're really stating a hypothesis, then they just look at you like you know everything and then they don't want to be your friend anymore, right? So you, you just have to be careful, okay? Any questions? Okay, let me see where I want to go with this. A lot of the experiments in science are controlled. And that what that means is that we run a control uh, where we control all of the variables and then we have a different, a different experiment where we change a variable. And that way we can compare things that would normally go as planned to things that have had some kind of an intervention, okay? And so this is why science works so well because we have all these controlled experiments. And sometimes you might, you might hear them as being a double blind study. And what that means is that the participant doesn't know what's going on and the researcher doesn't know what's going on. The only person that knows what's going on is the person who's conducting the experiment, right? And he is just, or she is just kind of observing, not part of the process. And then we have data that we bring in and we analyze the data, right? But if we think about what that is, right, we want to look at the different variables. And so some of the things we're going to be looking at in our first lab next week are independent versus dependent variables, right? The dependent variable are those things that are being tested and the dependent variable are those things that are being observed, right? We have an, an assumption that might occur and then essentially we're looking at these different variables, right? So in this case, if we have cancer and we have a new drug that we wanna test against a tumor, right? The dependent variable that we're looking at is the tumor, right? And the independent variable is the new therapy. Does it affect the tumor at all? Does it cause it to shrink? Does it cause it to die? What is it, right? But you can see that those variables are really important for us to understand, okay? So we have experimental groups, those that we change the variables, and we have a control group, those that we control the variable, right? And so it's important for us to continue to see that. And then we get a whole bunch of data, and we run it through a whole bunch of uh, statistical analysis, right? And so we're looking to see if there is a difference, right? If we see no significant difference between that treatment and the control group, then we say that there's no significant difference and we reject the hypothesis that this particular drug is effective against cancer, right? If we see a significant difference, right? That means that we cannot reject the hypothesis and therefore we need a little more study to be sure that um, that this is gonna work, right? And so we do this a lot of different ways, right? But some of you may have heard about the vaccines and how they were going through, uh, they were going through stage three uh, testing, right? 
to make sure that they were going to be effective. They had already been in stage one. Stage one really is about can that stuff be in the body without causing problems. Stage two is about safety and it has less people. And then stage three is a large clinical trial that we then look to see about the effectiveness of a drug or whatever we're looking at. Okay, any questions? All right. So there are two types of reasoning, right? We have inductive reasoning, right? From So inductive reasoning really is from different observations, we come to a general conclusion, right? Or deductive reason, we look at a premise and then from that premise, from that idea, we make predictions about how things might go. And a lot of times science uses both of these. It's important to understand how these things might work. So if we look at life, right, in order to be considered alive, we have to have cellular organization. Now that can be a single cell organism that's doing something so that it can sustain its life processes, but it can be also an organism, right? It has to, there has to be homeostasis, right? There has to be a balance of different systems within the cell or within the body the cell or the organism has to be undergo metabolism, right? It has to be able to take in nutrients, make different end products, and then get rid of those end products, right? Either by using them to build other others or to get rid of them as waste, right? The cell or the organism has to be interactive or responsive, right? So as I'm talking to you, you're listening to me, you're responding to the things I'm saying, right? Uh, there has the cells have to be able to reproduce. Now, most people think about reproduction who are not scientists, just simply making babies. That is one type of reproduction. That's that's sexual reproduction. But most things that are alive on this planet only undergo asexual reproduction. What's the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction? Can anybody tell me? What's the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction? Asexual what do you think? is one organism replicating itself, and sexual is two organisms sharing DNA to make a new. Oh, I like that. I like that last part, but can we augment the first part? So if let's just do this way: if we if if organisms undergoing asexual reproduction the end result is a clone. Are you with me? All those cells that come from that cell that are undergoing asexual reproduction are clones of each other. Would you agree with that? Was that Elijah that said that? Yeah, that's what I meant when I said replicating. I knew, I knew that's what you meant, Elijah. I knew that's what you meant. That's why I wanted to clarify. Okay. okay cool. So they're clones of each other. But in sexual reproduction, you have the joining of two different cells from two different two different organisms. And the end result is an organism that is, that is unique. It is the only one. Are you with me? So how many people know about Winnie the Pooh? How many of you have ever heard of Winnie the Pooh? Yeah, Kelly. Winnie the Pooh, I love Winnie the Pooh, but my favorite character Winnie the Pooh is Tigger. Because Tigger, yes, Kelly, go ahead. Yes, Kelly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I was trying to take it off, but it was already off. Oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah. So I love Tigger because Tigger says, I'm the only one. Are you with me? Well, you know what? Every one of you are the only one because when you were formed, you were formed from the union of two individuals. And when that union came together, the genetics that were put together by the formation of those two individuals will never happen again. Are you with me? So you're the only one, right? You are genetically unique. 
there'll never be another one like you. My mother always told me when I was growing up, somewhere in the world, you have a person who's just like you. And I would try to tell her, mom, that's not possible because of the way genetics work. But she would just look at me and she said, just go with it, okay? But really, you're the only one. Are you with me? There will never be another Connor. There will be a, never be another Elijah. There will never be another Timmy. They are the only ones. Are you with me? Because of the way the genes work. Because of the way genetics work. And that's really a beautiful thing. So if we think about those properties of life, right? Growth, reproduction, heredity, homeostasis, metabolism, the response to stimuli, right? Um, what what is ZC? I'm not I'm sure what that know what that means, but uh, but uh, it, it's an amazing thing to think about, right? And um, so it's important for us to understand that. The rest of this the rest of this uh, experiment. Oh, <laughs> okay. The rest of this is really kind of talking about things that are going to be important for 1407. I think I am probably not going to go over that. I'm going to invite you all to take a look at that. I'm not going to ask you about those things in this course uh, because, because they are much more about um, 1407. But I will, I will, at this particular slide right here, will be the end of the material that I will ask you about on our exam. Right. So we can book it. So this one right here will be the thing that I stop with. A lot of good stuff here. Um, but um, oh, actually, I found some stuff. Well, hold on a minute. So um, levels of organization. So if we think about this real quickly, atoms, which we're going to be looking at starting um, starting on Monday next week. Atoms come together, they form molecules. Okay, molecules come together and they form organelles. Okay, organelles come together and form cells. Cells come together and form tissues, right? So tissues can be um, the brain, they can be Oh, I'm sorry. They could be muscle tissue. They can be uh, all kinds of all kinds of different things in the body. They can be nervous cell. It could be all kinds of different things, right? But they're all doing a certain function. And then these can become organs. And then organs come together. Organs are like the heart and the brain. But in the in the plants, there are the leaves and the stems and the roots, right? So then um, the organ systems can come together and eventually you have an organism, right? And so that hierarchy, I know you know about it already, is important to understand, okay? So there is some stuff on here that we're going to start with next time. And that's gonna really be looking at the DNA structure and then talking about phylogeny. So I take my, I take my uh, statement back that the rest of the stuff is not important. The stuff about communities and populations and things like that, I will not ask you about, but I will ask you about, um, I will ask you about DNA and phylogenetics. And so we'll start there next time. Uh, what I might do is I might break this up and make another presentation so it's not as confusing. And then I will, I will call that um, phylogeny, but we will do that next time. Uh, so we're going to stop here for today um, because it's time to take a break. Does anybody have any questions about anything 